Good morning. I'm so glad to see you today. And uh, we're in a series right now on emotionally healthy spirituality. And uh, we've been, this is actually the sixth message in this series. And we're talking about some very powerful and often internal things. And sometimes some of us are pretty good at noticing things about people on the outside that tells us something about what's going on in the, the inside. Like you can tell when they're a little distracted or maybe uh, disrupted in some way. Maybe they're, they're frustrated or sad. Like we can pick up on those things. But some people, you can't tell. They just hide it really well. And, uh, and, and even physically, like there are things when you go to a, an emergency department or to a doctor, there's some things that they can't tell just by looking at, at the outside of you. So you go in, and sometimes they'll have to do an ultrasound or an x-ray or uh, an MRI. And that's, that's where they can get in beneath the surface and find out what's going on. When we talk about spiritual things, I mean, a lot of us try really hard to make that external so that you can get a sense of how well I'm doing by how I look on the outside. But there are just some things, some things that you can't really tell by looking on the outside. And in fact, sometimes in spiritual life, people can look great on the outside and be a hot mess on the inside. And sometimes people can look like a hot mess on the outside, but there's some really good stuff going on the inside. And so today we want to talk about what's, what's going on in that internal life and how can we kind of access what's going on in a way that helps us grow and develop and become what God would want us to be. Um, for some of us, uh, um, we were raised in a home where uh, you, you were given time out. Let's just see, anybody here? Yeah. How many, it was just a spanking. Let's check that, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, the culture's evolved now, and, and if you really want to punish a kid, take their phone away. That'll do it. Yeah. So, uh, being in, in, in a place by yourself, we've been, we've been taught that that's a punishment. And actually, solitary confinement is considered punishment everywhere in the world. But Jesus practiced something that surprises us because we are most attracted to him when he is standing on a hillside and multitudes are gathering and he's saying incredibly powerful things and he's doing incredibly powerful things and, and you can't take your eyes off him then. But there's something that he would regularly do and it was to go away and to be alone. And he engaged in this practice called solitude. And, and the thing is, is that we're very impressed by the life of Jesus, but we're not often impressed by the practices of Jesus. And, and there's a reason why we don't like being quiet and alone. We go through a form of withdrawal. Our life is built around certain activities and, and energies and, and being alone and quiet is not easy for us because, and you'll hear me say this a couple of times today, there are thoughts that begin to come to the surface and there are feelings that begin to come to the surface and we're not always uh, comfortable with those things. The Gospels tell us, all the Gospels share in multiple places, that Jesus would often go away to be alone. And the question is, why did he do that? What was driving that? Uh, Jesus had a lot to do. His, his days were full. There were, there were things to teach. There were people to minister to and serve. There was community to build. And yet, he was very intentional about taking some time away. And, and the, the reason is because he understood that when he spent time alone with his father, that's how he was able to see other people as his father sees them. See, if we don't learn how to practice some solitude in our life, and I know this is a foreign language right now in our culture, solitude is considered crazy. Like, and some of us think, well, I sleep. That's my solitude. And, and <laughs> that's not really solitude, that's sleep. It's a different word, solitude is different. And, and we get this, this idea, solitude. And so how can we embrace it? And, and if we don't, here's the challenge. If we don't, we will see people as problems instead of the way our Father sees them. And we will assume that we can only address these issues on our own wisdom and our own strength instead of some resources that God might make available to us. So... We're in Luke chapter five, and it says, while Jesus uh, 
uh, was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. That was considered out of bounds. Leprosy was considered a contagious disease and you didn't touch anybody with a disease. But Jesus touched him and he said, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He would go to the wilderness, which is not exactly like the, the sand dunes that we think of uh, when we think of a wilderness, but it was a place free of distraction. And, and when, when you went into the wilderness, there wasn't a lot to do. In fact, the desert kind of teaches us things by what it takes from us rather than what it gives to us. A lot of us assume that we only learn and grow by getting more or learning more. And the truth is, is that there are some things we have to let go of if we're going to learn. So a question I might ask you, you can think about is what or where is your desert? where you can go and just kind of disengage. We understand this in terms of relationships. If you have good friends or if, if you are uh, seriously connected in a relationship or you are married, you understand that it's very important that there be non-public interaction. That if you really want the relationship to go deep, you can't just interact with each other in, in public. There has to be some private conversations. This is very important. And yet for some of us, the only interaction we have with God is public. And you should know that that affects the kind of relationship you, you have. If you have friends and the only time you see them is when a lot of other people are around, there's only so far that relationship can go. By the way, the inverse is also true. There are some people just very uncomfortable with anybody around and the only time they'll be with you is if you are the only one who's with them. And, and what I can tell you is, is in Christianity, we are called to both solitude, where we have an intimate relationship with God, but also community, where we develop relationships with others. And anytime we get unbalanced in that, then we tend to not grow or what grows in us might not be healthy. And so it's a really interesting um, uh, approach. So uh, most of us, I think, feel the need to be active. Uh, let's just check this morning uh, how many on most given days and most weeks you feel relatively busy. If your hand is not up, we have some stuff for you to do. And, uh, but the challenge is, is that we often derive value out of our busyness. We prove to other people that we are significant or that we are important because we don't really have any downtime in our life. And, and so, so we get really busy and then most of us like some noise going on around us. Most of us don't like quiet very much. When you get in the car, what do you do? You, you probably turn some music on or a podcast or you listen to the radio. When, when, when you are at home, if, if you're eating at home alone, do, do you eat in quiet or do you just flip the TV on? Or if you, Whatever it is, we, we have music on demand. We have talking on demand and we have people around us a lot. I mean, it used to be you, your house might be miles from somebody else's house way back in the day. And now we're surrounded all the time and there's a lot of noise and it's very difficult to be alone and it's very difficult to be silent. But yet those moments alone with God are where we are shaped by God. So my question is when and where in your life are you going to be shaped by God? So, well, I'm here. Good. And I'm grateful. Like, I'm not saying this is, this is not important or not significant, but I'm telling you it's not enough. 
This matters. But if all we do is this, there's a lot of God we're never going to understand. There's a lot of growth we're never going to experience. So once again, Jesus kind of shows us how to do this. What did he do? He would withdraw. Uh, we tend to overpack our lives. Um, I, I, Sue and I were on vacation. We were in Florida and we, we ordered a lift to take us somewhere that we wanted to go. And, and this is what the person, uh, I don't know what it is about me. People just start telling me things. <laughs> Even when I'm on vacation. And so he started telling me about uh, a job that he used to have up in Massachusetts. And he told me about the divorce that he'd gone through with his wife. And he told me what his son's aspirations were. And, and we're, we're just like, I'm not in the car for a half hour. Like this is just a few minutes. And, uh, and then he tells me that when he moved to Florida, this, this is what he said, around here, all the bottles are full and the women are empty. And he said, I thought the most exceptional sexual life I would ever have was my college days. And I will tell you that what happened when I got down here made those pale in comparison. And there's a part of me that's going, hey, you're talking to a preacher here. <laughs> Just... We fill our calendars, but that doesn't mean our life is full. It just means we're busy. And there's something inside of us that doesn't manage that very well. Something feels like it's starving, like it's fading, like it's disintegrating inside of us. But Jesus would often withdraw. In fact, often is a key word here. It was not just when he felt exhausted or, or, or when he was frustrated. He didn't wait until something broke down for him to spend some time away. Often, sometimes it was early in the morning before anybody else was up. He was out and by himself. Sometimes it was after everybody else went to bed. He was out and by himself with his father. And he would go to lonely places, withdraw often to lonely places. And uh, what's that? It's just a place free of distraction. No one else was driving the conversation. This is not a lonely place. You are not thinking your own thoughts. Well, some of you are. But most of you are thinking, at least some of you, at least I hope some of you are thinking thoughts that I'm suggesting for you. But you know what? When you're by yourself, what are the thoughts that start surfacing? And he prayed. And for us, for a lot of us, prayer is mostly just asking God for the stuff that we need, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but is that considered a really deep relationship? In, in my experience, there comes an age where kids, that's pretty much the conversation they have with their parents. They just need something. Can you imagine if, if with your spouse, the only time they talk to you is when you need something. And, and so God's not frustrated by us coming to him with our needs. He actually calls us and invites us to do that. But it's an incomplete conversation. And prayer is intended to be a conversation, which means that two people should be talking. And so the question is, how do you let God talk to you? Would he have to interrupt you to get a word in edgewise? So he would pray. So there's four things I think solitude does for us. By the way, these are not the only four. These are just the top four I'm choosing to focus on today. I think there's more than I could, could create a list for. But number one, in solitude, we find our identity. Right now, for a lot of people, our identities are being shaped by digital and social media. Our identities are being shaped by voices in our culture, which, by the way, often have an agenda. And their agenda is not so much that they care for you. Their agenda is that they want more power or they want to take power away from somebody else. And this is not a right or a left issue. Both sides play this game all the time. All the time. And so where do we gain our identity? And a lot of our culture thinks, well, the way you find out who you really are is you just, you look deep inside. You, you stare in a mirror for a long time. You will not learn what you need to know about yourself just by looking at yourself because there's things beneath the surface that have to be addressed. You can't see it. 
Our identity can be found and discovered when we have a connection and time with our Creator because He knows what He created us to be. And so our identity is found in solitude. In solitude, we learn to release control. I know that sounds like swear words to some of us. There are some people in this room, you are control, what's the next word? Freaks, yeah, you know who it is. <laughs> and there are some people, that they're proud of that. That's right, I'm a control freak. That's right, when I let other people take control of things, everything around here goes to, well, you know where. So, thank God I'm in control. And if I'm not in control, I ought to be. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, maybe, I'm not saying you don't do a better job than somebody else, but what I'm telling you is, if you walk around thinking that you have to be in control for things to work out, you will eventually run into a set of challenges that will destroy you at every fiber of your being. So, when can you release control? Do you believe that if you timed out for a few minutes that God could still keep the rest of the stuff in your life going okay? Um, one of the issues with control is, is our, our desire to, to uh, promote our, our own will. And uh, we, we're told a lot of times that what we need is more willpower, right? I would weigh less if I had more willpower. That's what I'm told. Uh, I would have gone further in education if, if I had more willpower. That's what I'm told. I could earn more money or save more money if I had more willpower. That's what we're told. Willpower, willpower is the answer, except willpower is the problem. Everything that we have, or a lot of what we have and what we're dealing with, is actually because that's what I wanted. My, my willpower got me that. And now it doesn't always work out the way that I want. Willpower is often not enough, but there's a way that we can surrender our will to God's will. When Jesus was in the garden, what happens? He knows what's coming. It's the cross. It's the crucifixion. He knows how much pain is going to be involved. He knows how long this is going to take. He knows what's going to happen with his friends. He knows all this stuff well in advance. And so in the garden, you hear him praying to his heavenly father, if there's any possible way, I would prefer not to go through this. But what does he do? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What does he do? He exercises his will by surrendering or yielding to the will of his Father. And that's where he gains strength. Do you have any idea how many decisions you make in a day? They've done studies. The average American makes, are you ready? The average American makes 35,000 decisions a day. I just got tired saying it. <laughs> we decide what time we're going to get up. We decide what we're going to wear. We decide what we're going to eat. We decide when we're going to eat. We decide now or then. We decide here, decide here or there. We, we decide all kinds of things. There's a reason why Johnny Cash and, and, and John the Baptist and Steve Jobs all wore the same thing every day for work. It was one less decision to make. <laughs> just get up. This is what I always wear. And the challenge is we are told that if you make more decisions, your decision-making muscles get stronger. Nope, they get more tired. And that's why you see people who think they're in control of their life crash and burn right in front of your eyes. What was going on? They can't yield control. And here's what happens, all right? It's a really interesting dynamic. If you ever want to try this, this is a really good exercise too, by the way. So sp find a place to be alone and quiet by yourself. It's going to be uncomfortable. Just got to tell you, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. It's going to be uncomfortable. And then some thoughts are going to start coming to your head. Thoughts about stuff you're afraid will happen. Thoughts about stuff you know are going to happen. Thoughts about just some very uncomfortable thoughts and some emotions that come along with it. And here's a really powerful thing you can do in that moment. That stuff comes up. Here it comes. Father, not my will. Your will be done in that. Oh, my kids, my kids, my kids. Oh, Father, not my will. 
You, my spouse, my job, my income, my college, my classes, my professor, my paper, my, all these things. We got 35,000 things to process in a day. Most of us don't spend that much time on any of it. But the truth is, is that some of that stuff creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of pressure in our life. And when we get alone, that starts coming to the surface really fast. And Jesus discovered that when that comes up, this would be a good discovery for you to make too. Father, not what I want but what you want. You're exercising your will, but the exercise of your will is for God to have his way, not for you to get your way. It's a very powerful thing to do. Uh, thirdly, in solitude, we commune with God. The goal of solitude has to do with commune with God rather than just clearing our mind. When these thoughts start coming and these emotions start coming, it's, it's really hard to figure out which of them are from God. Let's say you want to hear from God. And this thought comes to you. Just go up to that person and slap the heck out of them. <laughs> How do you know if that's a God thought or a you thought? And I'm afraid to ask the question. How many of you think that's a God thought? And, and here's another thing. Sometimes we try, have you ever tried to do this? I'm going to get along with God and I'm, I'm going to have a spiritual thought. And we wait for it and, and one doesn't seem to come. Does that ever happen to you? No? You'd be surprised how often I do not have a spiritual thought. So how are we supposed to manage that? Well, uh, there's this great passage. I'm going to read it out of the message translation because I just love the honesty of the language and I think it's very appropriate to... The, the Apostle Paul is talking about things that tend to be just us in our flesh and things that tend to be from God's Spirit. And this is what he says. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper and uh, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I've warned you. You know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens if we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an or in orchard. Things like affection and f affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to everyone else calls, necess uh, calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified, since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit. Let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us are better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Uh, I'll ask the worship team to come up. The fourth point is in solitude, we make ourselves more available to God's grace. Because in solitude, we can't really hide. Stuff comes to the surface. 
our desires and our fears, these are strong voices internally. And in solitude, we begin to see what's really going on inside and that's uncomfortable. We begin to realize that there's some hate and unforgiveness in there. There's some jealousy and envy in there. There's some things that happen in our lives and what we want is, well, we tell ourselves it's justice, what it really is is revenge. And being in the presence of a holy God and having that stuff come to the surface is uncomfortable. I know some people I can hang around that if I share those things, they'll, they'll pat me on the back. But with God, he sees it for what it is and he shows it to us for what it is. And that's uncomfortable, but here's the beautiful thing about it is in those moments, that's where we find his grace. that God doesn't call us into solitude and private time with him because we've earned it. God calls us into those moments of solitude and private time with him because we need it. That I'm carrying around this kind of toxic waste inside of me. And even being alone for a few minutes, stuff starts coming up and out and it makes me very uncomfortable. And yet, when I'm in solitude with God, every time one of those things come up, I just say, Father, I need your grace for this. I can't manage this on my own. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough resources to fix this. I need your help. And grace, grace flows like a river. You don't have to be a hermit. You don't have to spend 30 days and the wilderness but you'd be surprised if you can find even a few minutes in a day shut out the distraction turn off the phone sit quietly not to earn something from God but just simply to be with him I'm not checking a box I'm not proving I'm more spiritual I'm not trying to get extra credit here I just want to be with you it's amazing what kind of work God does in those places. So would you bow your heads right now? And I want to invite you into just a moment of solitude, of silence. I know you're next to people, but let's just close our eyes and let's just be with God. Father, help us find our identity in you. Help us experience your grace so that our lives are transformed and we begin to see others the way you do and we have a resource to bring with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.